Great. Uh, we're extremely happy to have Emi Nakamura here from Berkeley. Uh, um, Emi is uh, difficult to fly over to Europe, and not least since she recently won the John Bates Clark Medal for the economist under the age of 40 uh, who made significant contribu contributions to economic thought and knowledge. So we're very happy to have Emi uh, online. And uh, uh, Emi, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's my first web seminar, so um, I want to encourage you guys to ask questions by, you know, speaking because I may not see you, you know, if, you, if you're trying to signal to me. So please uh, definitely jump in um, when you want to. So um, this, this paper is called The Housing Wealth Effect, uh, Housing Wealth Effects the Long View, and it's joint with um, Adam Gurren, Alistair Mackay, and John Steinstein. So um, as you can imagine, it's about um, housing wealth effects. And uh, in the recent period, a substantial amount of evidence has accumulated showing that these effects are, are large, um, much of it uh, done by Nian and Sufi and, and others following up on their work. But a lot of this research was uh, for the Great Recession period. And so, uh, you know, one narrative that arises is that perhaps there was something special about that time period. So in the boom, you know, people talk about phenomena like um, ninja loans and HELOCs and so on that may have made housing wealth effects particularly large during this period. And in the bust, there's the idea that perhaps households got pushed up against their, um, their borrowing constraints and that made them particularly sensitive to fluctuations in house prices. So in this paper, what we're going to do is but we're going to- Emmy, Emmy, my, yes. may I just ask you, when you say housing wealth effects, you mean, um, housing prices going down or households housing wealth and that causes them to cut their consumption expenditures yeah that, so it's you know what right we're going to focus on what i'm going to refer to as the housing wealth elasticity which is going to be like the percentage change in consumption in response to a given percentage change in house prices so that's okay. going to be my definition mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a new approach to estimating uh, these effects um, using an instrument we refer, refer to as a sensitivity instrument um, that's going to give us much more precise estimates than uh, some of the previous analysis based on the size instrument. So the basic um, intuition for this sensitivity instrument is that we're going to make use of the fact that when the US um, or particular region of the United States go into a housing boom, some uh, some cities respond much more than other cities in a systematic way, you know, not just in one boom or bust cycle, but in but in many. And so we're going to use this to look at the differential effect of fluctuations in house prices in some cities versus other cities. And this approach is going to uh, yield much more precise estimates of housing wealth effects than the size instrument. And so it's going to let us go further back in time and to come up with time varying estimates of how the housing wealth elasticity is going back to the 1980s. So we have three main findings based on this approach. First of all, we're gonna find somewhat smaller housing wealth effects, uh, housing wealth elasticities than previous estimates, um, though you know, still very much economically significant. Second of all, we're gonna find that um, this recent period of time, the 2000s, actually did not have uh, particularly large housing wealth elasticities. If anything, these effects were larger in the past. Now I wanna emphasize here, I'm talking about the elasticity. Uh, so clearly the, the house price movements in the 2000s were much larger in the United States than previously. Yeah. But, um, but the, we're gonna find that the effect, the elasticity was not, was not particularly large. If anything, it was smaller than previously. And third, we're gonna, um, you know, we looked for whether there were differential effects of increases versus decreases um, in, in house prices, and we don't find any evidence of that. So we don't find any evidence of a boom-bust asymmetry. So some of you who are kind of more theoretically minded may be kind of asking yourselves, so, so what do I mean um, when, uh, when I talk about a housing wealth effect or housing wealth elasticity? Um, maybe for an individual, house prices can be taken as given, and then you could just look at the partial equilibrium reaction of, say, consumption to house prices. But at the level mm -hmm. of city or a country, house prices are uh, an equilibrium object. And then maybe it's kind of hard to think about, like, what's the, what's the effect of a house price fluctuation given that's an equilibrium object? So in the, in the theory section of the paper, the first thing we do is we try to provide some guidance um, of how to think about these uh, objects, and I'm going to estimate the empirical part. And we show that in a very simple model where all markets um, are national, then the housing wealth elasticity that I estimate 
is going to be just exactly equal to the partial equilibrium, housing walk elasticity. And the reason is that all of the general equilibrium effects, um, and, and in fact, all of the shocks that cause the house price fluctuation in the first place are gonna cancel out in the time fixed effects because they'll be national in scope. Um, now, this isn't a very realistic model because it has these um, perfectly um, uh, national markets, but then we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna also introduce a more realistic model that has local labor markets and show that in that context we can relate the object that I'm going to estimate, these housing wealth elasticities at a local level, to the partial equilibrium uh, housing wealth elasticity using evidence on the effects of other demand shocks like the uh, like evidence from the fiscal multiplier literature. So in, in particular we're going to show that the thing that I'm going to estimate, um, the thing this literature has been estimating, is equal to the partial equilibrium um, housing wealth elasticity multiplied by uh, by, by an estimate of the fiscal uh, estimate of the fiscal multiplier that we can get you know from from the other literature, so so that's going to be the first thing that we're going to do in this theory section, and then mm -hmm. the second thing we're going to do is we're going to provide a new model of a partial equilibrium housing wealth uh, elasticity where, where we're going to in introduce um, you know sort of the standard features that have been used in in this recent literature. There's been a rapidly growing theoretical literature trying to understand um, housing wealth effects. And the key ingredients people have introduced are uninsurable risk, uninsurable income shocks, and, and borrowing constraints. And then we're going to, we're going to study you know, what would you expect to have happened to the housing wealth elasticity during this period using this sort of canonical model that people have been, have been studying. And what we find using this model is that actually the model, like the data, does not imply particularly large housing wealth elasticities in the 2000s. And that's despite the fact that there was, in, in the data, there's, there's a very large increase in the loan to value ratio of households during the 2000s. So people really are you know, getting, getting closer to their, their borrowing constraints. And the intuition for this is twofold. Uh, first of all, it turns out that in this model, um, a, a big part of the housing wealth effect is actually coming from um, households who are far from their, from their borrowing constraints, who are just not, not that affected by these shifts in the LTV distribution. And the second factor is that during, um, during the financial crisis, there were a substantial number of households that were shifted toward their borrowing constraints as they become more constrained and they do become more responsive to house price changes. But there were also a substantial number of households that actually go beyond that and, and become underwater. And once they become underwater, they become completely unresponsive uh, to, to house price changes. And those things to some extent cancel that. So, um, you know, the bottom line is that the model actually also is, is going to, you know, this, this was very much a surprise to us, is, is not going to generate a particularly high housing wealth elasticity in, in the 2000s, and I'll, I'll show you why. Okay, so that, um, that's my introduction. Um, in terms of the related literature, I talked about, you know, a lot of these seminal papers by Miyana Sufi, also by Case, Quigley, and Schiller. Um, what, what there really isn't in the empirical literature is um, estimates of a time varying nature of these housing wealth elasticities uh, using a consistent methodology over time. Okay, so. Um, uh, Emmy, yes. Emmy, might I ask you one more? I mean, say, you know, many central banks, they would have maybe like a model of, you know, like consumption is some function of disposable income, and then it would be, say, some housing wealth uh, variable, you know. If you thought about, say, that as a long run, you know, then they would do maybe co-integration. So you estimate like a long run equation, like, you know, Engel Granger co-integrating regression between, say, consumption, disposable income and housing wealth. If you find, if you find, say, on US data that, say, you know, consumption, disposable income ratio is basically constant over time, you know, I can see, you know, then I guess that would suggest that, say, housing wealth wouldn't really play. But I thought that most like FRB US, you know, in that regression, the consumption the disposable income is not exactly stationary. And they would argue that sort of housing wealth, which I think is trending a bit more upward than, say, disposable income over time, would then sort of help to explain that you know, shift in disposable or, you know, shift in consumption relative to disposable income. Yeah, I, mean, I, I was just interested if you think that's sort of relevant or interesting or not really the question, you know, you're not interested in saying aggregate elasticity. So what, what do you say? So, so let me say two things. One is that I think it's absolutely right that house, houses are becoming a much bigger part of, of consumers' balance sheets. And so that, and that's going to show up in the model too. You know, one force that is going to go in the direction of making these effects larger is the fact that just 
houses are really expensive in the United States today. And so naturally mm -hmm. they matter more uh, to, to consumers. In terms of you know, the comparison versus aggregate effects, I think it's mostly gonna be a matter of identification. So we're gonna really try okay. really hard to come up with um, a scheme to come up with the causal effect of house prices on consumption. That's gonna be hard because you know, the natural question is if you see house prices and, and consumption both go up, you know, which causes which? Is yeah. it that yeah, you yeah. Know, the economy is booming mm -hmm. and house prices go up or, or the reverse? So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna try really hard to make progress on that front. Okay. Okay, so um, the data that we're going to use, um, the, the housing data is for 380 um, CBSA, that, think of that as basically cities, for the period 1975 to 2017. Um, our, our basic data is from Freddie Mac. Um, we also use some, some other private sector data as sort of a robustness check. And then our proxy for consumption is going to be retail employment. So this is not a proxy for consumption that's been used very much in, um, in this literature, but it is something that's used a lot by measurement authorities and agencies and so on. So uh, retail employment is sort of the main proxy for consumption that's used, uh, for example, in the BEA regional accounts. Um, the reason is because uh, if, if you look at um, PCE as measured by the Bureau of Economic Analysis, it comes really strongly with uh, retail employment. And I think the intuition is that retail employment is sort of like a, intermediate input into consumption. You know, you go to the store, you buy stuff, then you need, um, then you need, you know, you need retail workers, essentially. And so ECOMA is very strong. ECOMA is actually more strongly than, than many of the sort of subsectors of consumption that have sometimes been, been used in this literature. One thing that you might wonder about is the role of like the internet and big box stores and online retailing, Amazon and stuff like that. Um, now, these lines both have a, a very small trend taken out over the whole sample period, and there's a slight downward trend in retail employment relative to PC, so that may partly reflect this phenomena, but there is not any kind of strong break um, in the relationship in the recent period, I mean, that one can see using aggregate data, uh, which is kind of an interesting fact. I think this is something, you know, these, these, these factors will, will probably matter in terms of um, retail employment being used as a proxy in general for employment uh, for consumption going forward, but, but this is a relationship that seems to be, uh, you know, fairly stable uh, going back in time. So that's the proxy that we're going to use uh, for consumer expenditures. So then um, here's the regression that we're going to try to estimate. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have our, um, our proxy for consumer expenditures of the Y. And I is the, the city, R is gonna be a region, and T is, a, T is the quarter, T is time. And then on the right-hand side, you have this delta, uh, delta P, I, R, T, and uh, that's, that's house prices. So the beta here is the coefficient of interest, and that's gonna be this elasticity. Um, what is the percentage change in consumer expenditures in, 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 um, in reaction to a one percentage point change in the, a 1% 1 change in uh, house prices. So the goal is going to be to estimate beta. And then the central empirical challenge is gonna be this endogeneity problem that I just described. So if you just ran this regression by OLS, you know, um, you would have to ask the question, if you found a substantial beta, is it that house prices are causing increases in consumption or is it that economic booms are causing increases in house prices? So that's, that's the basic reason why this empirical problem is really hard. So we're gonna introduce a new approach to identification, which um, is gonna be a little different. Let me warn you, it's gonna be a little different than things you've seen before in this situation. So I'm gonna kind of build it up in, in steps and, and feel free to ask questions because it's, it's a little bit subtle how it works. So this is basically a simultaneous equations problem, right? So, so house prices affect consumption and then consumption affects house prices and there's a simultaneous equations problem and that's the problem in terms of identification. Um, and the intuitive approach that we're gonna use, as I said at the beginning, is to exploit the fact that different cities in the United States react differently to uh, national house price cycles. So um, for example, um, when the Northeast region in the United States goes into a uh, house price boom, so that's the green line on this graph, then there's a systematic difference in the response of house prices in Providence versus Rochester. You see that it's pretty systematically the case that house prices in Providence respond more to this national cycle or to this regional cycle than uh, house prices in Rochester. So uh, another thing I want to sort of note about this graph is the fact that you can see that once you look at the regional 
um, house price cycles as opposed to only in the national house price cycles, you can see that there really have been substantial cycles or uh, fluctuations in house prices, even going back to the 1970s. So it's often said in the United States that there weren't really any large fluctuations um, uh, you know, in house prices or large declines in house prices before the last um, house, house price cycle. But if you look at regional housing prices, you can see that actually there were, there were house price cycles going further back in time. So that's part of the reason that we're going to use the regional uh, cycles, you know, to identify uh, our, our effects in our paper. And so, so Amy, uh, on this, so can you speculate a little bit about uh, the reasons for these sort of uh, high versus low sensitivity uh, cities? Is it uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Or? absolutely. So the, the, the simplest way of thinking about this is kind of the same intuition as with the size instrument, that there are just places that have high versus low supply elasticities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, places that are surrounded by fields, you know, I think, I mean, perhaps you've been to Rochester, would be easier to build in than places that are somewhat, um, somewhat more constrained. So that's a kind of natural interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, what, what we're adding here, though, is that because we're going to be directly um, uh, estimating these elasticities as opposed to inferring them from, um, say, topological measures of, of um, the availability of land, there are going to be some other factors that probably also matter for this. So one example I'll talk about later is the example of Pittsburgh versus Las Vegas. So those are actually two cities which have, uh, are fairly similar in terms of the, um, the topological kind of measures of, um, of housing supply. Um, so they look similar in that dimension. But if you think about the dynamics of what could make a place constrained or not constrained, those cities are probably very different. You know, Las Vegas is a place where some people have wildly optimistic views about what's going to happen in the future. Pittsburgh is probably a place where that's not the case. Um, and what we find in our estimates is that Pittsburgh and Las Vegas look very different in terms of you know, our estimates of these elasticities, whereas in terms of the pure topological measures, they, they're very similar. Uh, so that's kind of, so, but, but I think the simple answer is, is, you know, just think about this, the simple answer is just think about this as some kind of attempting to get some kind of estimate of these differences in, in housing supply elasticities across locations. Okay, so looking at this picture, um, a simple way of proceeding in terms of these periods would be to try to estimate these um, elasticities. So that would be um, the, 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 the differences in sensitivity to the regional house price cycles. Um, that's the gamma in this regression here. Um, so here on the left hand side, I have the city level house price indexes. And on the right hand side, I have the regional house price indexes. And then one could estimate um, the gammas for each city. So like in the example I just showed you, Providence would have a higher gamma than uh, Rochester. And so it, then if you could obtain these gammas, which you know I'm going to think about as being inversely related to these housing supply elasticities, then you could basically construct something analogous to a Bartik instrument, if, if you guys, some of you are familiar with that idea in, in the labor literature, where you take those gammas and you multiply them by the regional house price indexes as a way of constructing an instrument. So then the question that you would be asking was, would be, um, when there's a regional house price cycle, systematically we see a bigger response of house prices in Providence than in Rochester, do we see a bigger response of consumer expenditures in Providence and Rochester? And that would be, you know, a, a way of estimating this housing wealth elasticity. So that's sort of the, the first pass um, that one could think about here. But um, a concern that arises is that when we're running this regression that I have on this slide here, you might worry that what I'm picking up in the gammas might not really be these differences in housing supply elasticities across locations. Um, it, it might actually be something that's, that's endogenous to the industrial structure of the location. So suppose that instead of Providence being, say, more constrained in terms of building, the real difference is that Providence had more cyclical cyclically sensitive in, uh, industries. So suppose that Providence builds a lot of durable goods and Rochester doesn't or something like that. And so as a consequence, it's not that, you know, Providence has a different housing market, it's just that it has a different economy and the, the housing market is responding to that. So to address that kind of issue, the approach we're actually going to use um, is um, not to estimate these differential um, differential sensitivity parameters gamma uh, just by running a direct regression on the regional house prices, but to actually run, uh, to estimate them based on the residual of the fluctuations in local house prices after we've already included controls for local 
uh, economic activity. So here in this regression, it's the same as the last regression I showed you in the sense that on the left, left hand side, you have the local house price indexes. And then on the right hand side, you have this regional house price index. But the new terms here are controls for, this is gonna be um, employment in um, the local area, say province. And this is gonna be allowing for differential sensitivity to um, regional employment in the Northeast area. And these gammas are only going to be estimated off of the residual um, in house price fluctuations once you're controlled for local economic outcomes. So um, what's a little confusing about this, uh, was very subtle and hard for us to understand for a long time. And there's, there's some simultaneous equations math in the appendix to our paper, if you find, find this confusing, which you probably would do, is that, um, is that what we're gonna do is we're gonna estimate these gammas. We're gonna construct our instrument using the part of house prices um, residualized on local economic activity. So we're gonna, we're gonna be taking, we can think about it intuitively, it's gonna take house, local house prices in say Rajans, Rochester and Providence, and we're gonna run a regression on local employment in those areas. And then we're only gonna estimate the gammas off of the residual um, after those components have been taken out. But then we're going to construct an instrument for house price variation, and we're going to use that instrument to estimate the effects on local economic activity. And you might be thinking, you know, I think we, we felt like this initially, like that wouldn't work. Like how can you use a residual after residualizing against local economic activity to then estimate the effects on local economic activity? You know, it sounds like it, it wouldn't work. And, uh, or they would be zero by construction or something like this. And uh, the thing that I want to um, the thing that I want to uh, mention here is that this is not the same as the usual demand and supply shock kind of way of coming up with instruments where you're um, where you're where you're constructing the instrument as a residual from the regression and then just using that as the say the supply shock. Here, where this initial regression, this regression here, is being used to to get this gamma i, which is a sensitivity parameter. But then we're going to apply this sensitivity parameter. Uh, multiply it times the whole regional house price variation as a way of constructing the instrument. And uh, that's the reason why we don't run into this problem that um, you know, the effect would be zero by construction or something like this. Um, so anyway, the, the thing I want to emphasize is just that this is somewhat, it's a somewhat different idea. The intuition is that we're going to use the residual of local house price variation, uh, taking out the component that's endogenously related to local economic activity. We're going to use that residual to estimate the sensitivity to regional house price fluctuations. And then once we have the gammas, we're going to sort of construct something like a Bartik instrument, where we multiply these gammas times uh, regional house prices and use that as an instrument for local house price variation. Uh, now, one I thing ask, I want to that Sorry, go ahead. Emma, may I ask, is that sort of, because you added in the introduction that you sort of have a smaller elasticity than some of the previous work has. Yeah. Is that driven by the fact if you, are, you make these controls, if you don't control for this, do you get more results that are in line with previous literature or how yeah, does so it work? Yeah, I will go through that in, in quite some detail, but, but I think it is, you know, I think that the differences are consistent with the view that, you know, our, our, um, our instrument may be taking away, taking out a little bit more. But I'll, I'll show you some okay. slides. Exactly. All right. There's several things that come into it. So one thing that I want to emphasize before we get to that is that um, this instrument is very powerful. So we're not like picking up some tiny slice of kind of irrelevant variation. Um, the, if, if you look at this regression where you're running regression of local house prices on um, local employment fluctuations and differential sensitivity to, to, to uh, regional employment fluctuations, then um, the R squared uh, of that regression, if you don't include any, you know, our instrument essentially is, is 18%. So it's like 18% of the variation of local house prices you can view as endogenous to local economic fluctuations. But if you add this differential sensitivity to aggregate house price fluctuations, regional house price fluctuations, the, the R squared rises from 18% to 62%. So it's a very important driver uh, of, of local house price fluctuations. And you can, you can see it, from this graph that I showed you, um, you know, this Providence versus you know Rochester case isn't, you know, it isn't like an atypical case. It really, you know, this this um, role of the common component of uh, house price fluctuations is, is quite important, even controlling for local economic outcomes. Okay, so um, 
So now let me uh, talk a little bit more about the relationship to, to other instruments and so on. So here is, um, in the first, uh, first picture is our gamma i, so these sensitivity um, numbers that I showed you. So this would be you know, where uh, Providence would be high and, and Rochester would be low. Um, and the, and it's, a, it's a heat map, so darker means a higher value of the sensitivity. And B is this size um, el housing elasticity that, that has been used in literature, which is basically based on looking at um, how much land is sort of available in the area around the city. And this is, um, you know, we, we, we uh, this is, uh, you know, flipped in the, in the direction where this thing should be directly comparable. So it's, you know, the darker is, is areas that have less availability of land. So I think when you look at this first, you say, you know, they're pretty similar in terms of the broad outlines. You see um, that the coastal places um, have a lot, have, have a lot um, more um, sensitivity in our, in our instrument than the places that are inland. And that kind of makes some sense. You know, if you look at San Francisco, it's, you know, these are places that are hard to build. But actually, um, from a statistical standpoint, the correlation between these two, these two estimates is not, is not so high. It's something like, um, you know, 20% or 30%. And the reason is that there are some very important differences. So an example is the one I mentioned earlier about Pittsburgh versus Las Vegas. So actually Pittsburgh versus Las Vegas, if you look at the size, um, size measure, um, are, are quite similar uh, in terms of how much land unavailability they have. So from the perspective of that measure, they're very similar. But um, from the perspective of our measure, Las Vegas is much more sensitive than Pittsburgh. So why might that be? I mean, I think at an intuitive level, the way to think about what we're doing is, is we're, we're, we have a more holistic measure of the possible reasons why um, you know, cities might have greater, you know, lower supply elasticities or greater responsiveness to these house price uh, fluctuations. Um, and and one, um, one recent paper that I think is very insightful on this point is the paper by Nathanson and Zwick, where they point out in particular that it's not just the um, availability of land right now, but it's the, the trajectory of growth in cities that matters a lot uh, in, term, in terms of uh, determining um, how, how uh, constrained uh, a city's uh, housing supply might be. So in a place where um, you know, there's a certain amount of land, but people expect explosive growth in the city going forward, that's a very different situation in terms of people's perceptions of what house prices should be than in a city where you have a lot of land availability and there's no real expectation of a lot of growth. And so I think the way to think about our measure is that all of those things could potentially be captured by, by these gammas that we're estimating. So um, let me draw the analogy to this Bartik instrument in labor. So this is, you know, this is kind of a well-known identification approach in labor. Um, an example of uh, the kind of uh, approach that might be used there is that you might use differences in, um, in exposure to say the oil sector in different locations to estimate uh, the effects um, of, of changes in, in <coughs> uh, demand. And there you, you know, you're looking at the fact that say Texas is much more exposed to the, to the oil sector than, uh, than Minnesota. Um, so of course these things aren't randomly assigned. I mean, exposure to the oil sector is not randomly assigned. Just like when you look at when you look at our graphs here, I mean, it's clearly not randomly assigned. But the identifying assumption is that there isn't some some additional factor which is both correlated with the aggregate house price fluctuations in the time series and in the cross section is correlated with the exposure. Uh, to um, to these higher elasticities, so that would be the kind of thing that you would have to be worried about in this context. Much like in the case of um, um, much like in the case of the Bartik instrument. So, like in the Bartik instrument, where it's about exposure to oil, you'd have to be worried about you know some other aggregate factor which kind of looks like oil in the time series, but also has the same incidence in the cross section. You know where Texas is also higher than Minnesota, um, and and if there was some factor like that, then that would be the kind of thing that would cause a problem. Okay, so um, a couple more details before I get to um, the estimates. So we're going to have uh, 10 year rolling windows for our sort of baseline estimation. I, I told you I was gonna show you these um, time series plots. And um, when we construct this instrument, like when we're constructing the gammas, we're going to use a leave one out approach, both on the time and the city. So like when we're estimating the sensitivity of a given city, 
uh, to the regional fluctuations, we're always going to be estimating it from other time periods, um, not the time period that we're actually um, estimating the elasticity for. And um, so we're, these gammas by construction, they have to be picking up something persistent over time about, um, about the sensitivity to, to regional house price fluctuations. Is, I mean, is this also true for the other parameters in your, um, in your first uh, pass uh, regression? Is it, uh, because since you mentioned Rochester as, a, as an example, um, when I was in the job market, they were advertising Rochester for having dirt cheap houses because of the structural shifts to the local economy and uh, big companies having shut down or seriously. Uh, um, um, yeah, yeah. So that would be exactly. So are you are you going to be modeling these other parameters? Uh, I forget now. Um, um, sort of as time varying as well, or just the exposure parameter that you that's your main coefficient of interest in the first pass. Well, um, just the exposure, um, just the exposure parameter is going to be time varying, but there will of course be a lot of other time varying controls. Um, and then in that particular example that you're describing, that would be the kind of idiosyncratic fluctuation in, you know, if it was something specific to to Rochester and not the whole Northeast mm -hmm. region, that would be the kind of idiosyncratic fluctuation that wouldn't show up, you know, in our instrument at all. Because the idea would be that we would only be using the part of the fluctuations in house prices in Rochester that's related to the regional house price index in the same way that it has been systematically in other time periods. So that would be the kind of thing that our instrument would be taking. But, th but there might be a local trend uh, sort of going on that uh, maybe you're capturing yeah. because you do everything in changes. or uh, Yeah, yeah. So and that's going to be one of the main benefits of, of using this specification. So one thing that's different about what we're doing relative to most of the recent literature is that our analysis is all going to be a panel analysis. So it's going to allow us to include, you know, like fixed effects that allow for differential trends. And that's actually, you know, in response to the other question about differences versus um, in the results versus other methods, the ability to include these um, other kinds of controls um, is, is, is an important difference. Mm -hmm. um, because if you think about trying to analyze just the last recession using a single cross section, you have this problem that perhaps places that had the biggest um, the biggest declines in house prices, perhaps they're just more systematically more cyclically sensitive. And if you're only using that one uh, cross-sectional period, like you only have, you know, the typical approach in this in this literature has been that it's not a panel regression; it's just a single cross-section regression. Then there's really no way to distinguish between those hypotheses that. You know, it was really the house price that caused things, or those places were just more cyclically sensitive. But if you have a panel, then of course you can, you can, you know, you can control for the cyclical sensitivity of the location, and that's that's something that we do. So I think that this panel aspect of our specification is also an important difference. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll I'll talk more about these controls. Okay, so here's the here's the sort of basic um, result um, that we we get from these uh, rolling window regressions. So here, um, each um, point um, is the midpoint of the 10-year window. Um, and, you know, to start out with, you can see that the recent period doesn't look particularly, you know, high. Um, and, um, you know, there's this hump in the earlier period. Um, you know, we don't have a good explanation for this. This is something that we're, you know, we've, we've We've sort of tried to verify that this is not coming from outliers or things like that, and we have not found any evidence of this. But we really don't have a good explanation for this. I think um, the closest we can come to an explanation is is to say that the house price fluctuations were were smaller around this time period, um, but the instrument still works well. It's still powerful. Um, conceivably, maybe some kind of nonlinearity where there's more responsiveness to to small changes might. Uh, might explain this, but this is something that to a large extent is kind of left unexplained in, in our paper. Um, here's uh, the comparison versus OLS. Um, so this is just running an OLS uh, regression. And here you see that um, OLS is the blue here and, and the, the, our, our basic IV approach is the red. So you can see, uh, and I think one thing that's important is that this time series pattern of a declining elasticity is not something that comes from our IV strategy. It's actually there in the OLS um, also. Um, also, uh, our IV approach does generate 
consistently somewhat lower estimates of housing wealth elasticity than the OLS. Uh, I'll show you, you know, the, the size instrument actually often generates somewhat higher estimates. And I think that having a somewhat lower estimate is, is sort of more intuitive in terms of the, the natural direction of, uh, of endogeneity, although, you know, it could go either way because the, the instrument is, is also taking out measurement error. So here's a comparison versus the size instrument. So here the, the size instrument is the dark blue. I should have probably said this before, the, 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 the two lines that are above and below are the uh, standard error bands. So here what it's showing, our, our estimate here is the red, and then the, the dashed um, tan lines are the um, standard error bands for our estimate. And you can see that the size instrument is, is consistently a little bit higher in terms of the, the estimates of the effect but also the standard error bands are, are really massive um, going back before the recent period, you know, large enough that you just, you know, you kind of can't conclude anything uh, for the earlier time period. And, and that's related to the fact that, you know, we think that we're picking up um, um, more granularity in these differences in, in housing supply elasticity. So here's to just give you more uh, insight into the empirical um, methodology. So here's the, the first stage um, of the instrument. Uh, and you can see that it's, you know, it's a pretty linear effect of the instrument on changes in house prices. And on the right hand side, we have the, the reduced form. So this is just looking at the, the direct effect of, of, of the uh, changes in the instrument on retail employment. And again, you can see it's not, it's not coming from, um, from outliers here. It's, you know, it's a fairly linear relationship. Now I'll talk a little bit of the magnitude and the relationship to, to earlier estimates. So our pooled estimate over the time period from 1990 to 2017, which is the period over which we had sort of moderately large standard errors, is, is around 7%, which implies a marginal propensity to consume out of uh, housing wealth of about three cents on the dollar. So this is pretty substantial, um, but it is smaller than some of the previous estimates. Um, so you know, our elasticity was kind of, you know, 7% and some of these earlier estimates were, you know, considerably larger. So one question is how do you get from our estimate to some of these earlier estimates? And, um, and so here I'm going to compare versus the earlier estimates. Instead of using the panel approach, I'm going to use um, just a single cross section from 2006 to 2009 for comparability. And then I'm going to go through sort of all the differences. So uh, I'm going to start with um, with our with our number here, so six percent. So this is just because it's for this uh, this time period. And one important thing is that I'm taking out um, fixed effects that are estimated on the whole time period for for trend growth in house prices and employment. So this is relating to your question, Emmanuel, about the panel aspect. So here I'm kind of I'm, I'm using the panel structure to take out these fixed effects. If we don't use these fixed effects, then, then the elasticity grows to 9.6%. To so this is, I think, related to the concerns that have been expressed a lot in the housing literature that, you know, for example, there's a, there's a trend movement toward the coasts in the United States, and there's this worry that there are simultaneously shocks that are leading to more economic activity, but are also leading to, to house price increases. And those long-term trends are being taken out in these, um, in these fixed effects in our analysis. So then the next thing is that we do all our analysis in per capita terms, um, but a lot of the literature has, has not uh, divided by population. So adjusting for that, it doesn't make a huge difference, but it makes a little difference. Then the size instrument, um, so size constructed his, um, his instrument just for a particular sample of, of cities. I mean, it's a pretty large sample, sample of cities, 200 some cities, but we constructed our instrument for, for all of the cities. And so there's a slight difference again, um, associated with moving to the size sample and then moving from uh, the size instrument, so moving from our instrument to the size instrument, you know, raises the elasticity up to 0.16. So there you can see, um, you know, how you could get to a much higher number. And if we compare this to OLS, OLS over this time period is around 0.1. And uh, as I was saying before, our, our instrument generates a somewhat higher, a somewhat smaller um, estimate of this housing wealth elasticity than OLS, whereas the size instrument generates a somewhat higher estimate. Before you move on, how does this compare to the elasticity out of stock market wealth, say? Uh, I don't have the numbers mm -hmm. off the top of my head. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, that's that's okay. a good question. I think, 
Um, when I look at these numbers, I mean, our first reaction to this was, oh, this is much smaller. But then when you think about the, the magnitude, given how large the changes in, in house prices sometimes are, you realize that even these numbers um, can, can contribute mm -hmm. very significantly to, say, aggregate consumption fluctuations mm -hmm. during a recession. Mm -hmm. Um, but you would you would think, I mean, I mean, going back to Manu's question, say that stock market wealth is, um, you know, say more risky. I mean, more variance associated to that. I mean, it seems like here housing market wealth is more like a permanent thing than that elasticity should be higher or smaller for more transient, you know, or how, how is the thinking there? Yeah, that's, um, I mean, House prices are actually the growth rates are somewhat persistent. So there's that also oh, that yes, aspect. Exactly. All right. Gotcha. Stock That's prices, how you measure it. Yeah. Yeah. Stock prices are closer to a random walk. Um, so I think you're right in that sense that, that it's sort of super persistent. Yeah. But I think it's an interesting price to make. I mean, the other thing about house prices, of course, is that um, you know, just uh, so many people own a house, you know, stock stock market participation is relatively low outside of retirement wealth, but but owning a house is, you know, extremely common. So I think that's another thing that makes it an important question to study. Um, so the one difference in our empirical methodology is that we're running these rolling window regressions as opposed to some of the literature that has used uh, single cross-section analysis, um, which in most time periods doesn't, doesn't produce a sufficiently precise estimate to kind of say, say anything. I mean, for this, one time period for these time periods around the, the Great Recession, then you had really large movements in house prices. And so, um, you know, this is, this is a picture just showing the, the single cross section estimates for three year periods um, going back in time. And you can see that, you know, it was really only during the Great Recession that the, the, the movements in house prices were large enough to, for that method to give a precise sort of estimate. But, you know, but this panel approach where you're smoothing <coughs> the time uh, lets you let you go much further back in time. So another thing we look at empirically is um, whether there's evidence of a boom-bust asymmetry because that's, that's been an idea in the literature. It could be that because people get pushed into their borrowing constraints, maybe there's more responsiveness to house price declines and house price increases. Um, so we don't find any evidence of that. Um, so the estimates of response to house price decreases are kind of the same as, as to increases and are statistically the same. And um, intuitively, I think you can see that in the graph that I showed you, the fact that, um, that, that, that the recent period, which had such large house price declines, um, was not a period associated with particularly large housing wealth elasticities. So um, we, we have a bunch of, um, of controls. Let me see, maybe I didn't talk about this. So, um, so we have a bunch of controls um, in the regression. Uh, again, because it's a because it's a panel regression, we're able to um, include a lot of different controls. Uh, so I, I talked about the fact that we control for regional retail employment, but we also control for a bunch of financial variables like uh, differential exposure to um, the mortgage rate, differential exposure to risk spreads, um, and we include. Um, two-digit industry shares, so we just allow for um, flexible exposure to, uh, you know, differences in exposure to uh, industries. So in other words, uh, places, you know, will we'll allow for cities that have a different industry composition to be exposed proportionately to dummy variables for each time period for those industries. So the effects that we're estimating they are only effects that are on top of all of those different kinds of controls. We're also controlling for differential cyclical sensitivity. So if a city is just differentially, systematically responds more to aggregate fluctuations than another city, that's another thing that we're controlling for. And these are all things that are possible because we're using this panel methodology. Now in the end, um, none of these controls really make a difference except for the, uh, the industry controls. So the industry controls, I mean, it's very flexible. Here, we're just allowing cities, uh, cities based on their, their employment industrial composition to be differentially exposed to an industry level fixed effect. So it's sort of a very flexible way of controlling for things. And that, that leads to a slightly lower 
um, housing wealth elasticity than if we didn't include those controls, but the time series pattern is basically unchanged. Okay, so now um, let me let me so can I ask one question before you go on. Yes, uh, I vaguely remember there was a lot of criticism of the size instrument in the sense that uh, it sort of suggests that there should not be construction in the areas which are designed as uh, low sensitivity, but ultimately in the data there is a lot of construction going on and I think the explanation was going, you go up, you can't go on more land, you go up. Does your instrument sort of perform better in these dimensions? Is that it gets, does not violate the first stage in that sense? Well, I you think this that, sort of that our main, I think, I think our instrument has similar properties in that dimension that um, these places that, um, that have high house prices, they also in the short run have, um, have more construction. Um, now there's a question as to you know how to interpret that. The science instrument, the thinking was really about like a static model, and so in a static model, it's totally right that you know if you have um, a lower supply elasticity, of course you should um, you know you should keep constructing less stuff. Now a more realistic model, like I've I've, I've been talking about this idea that 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 there are a lot of dynamic considerations with housing. So a more realistic model is that really in all places housing supply is basically completely constrained in the short run. You know, if you look at, you know, housing starts, you know, there are permits and all kinds of things. There's basically no way anywhere of, of, of increasing housing supply a lot, you know, in the next year or something along those lines. So at some level, the, the whole question is about housing supply in the longer run. Um, and, and there, you know, the evidence is, is sort of, it, it, it's much more difficult to come up with long-term evidence. You can certainly come up with a model like we have we have some discussion of this in our paper where if you're in a location like say you're in san francisco and you think that um you think that in the long run san francisco is going to be very constrained whereas say you're in rochester you think that in the long run rochester is not going to be very constrained that in the short run you you know you might actually want to construct more in in san francisco than in in rochester now it still definitely has to be the case that in the long run um, you know, Rochester, you eventually end up responding more in terms of construction. My sense is that the evidence is, is a little more mixed there. Um, there was a, a New York Fed paper um, by a bunch of people from, from, from maybe 10 years ago, which was uh, arguing that if you look at this long run stuff, um, the, the supply looks like it lines up more with these kinds of ways that we have of thinking about the price responses. But I would say that the, the, that the evidence is, is kind of unclear. I, I think our our, our, our main um, kind of feeling about this issue is that the dynamics are more complicated than just the short run demand and supply curves would, would sort of suggest. But I think, I think this is a very interesting topic for, for thinking about more research. Uh, okay, so let me talk a little bit more about the, um, about the theory now. So uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, you, know, you might have this basic, um, basic thought in your mind, um, you know, how to interpret these housing wealth elasticities, because I'm, I'm running a regression of, um, of consumption on uh, local house prices, but the local house prices, of course, are endogenous. So how do you, how do you think about this object? Uh, so in a very simple model um, where, you know, you just think about these cities as um, separate housing markets, um, but all other markets are national then one can actually show that the object I was estimating, this beta I was estimating, would correspond directly to the average partial equilibrium response of consumption to house prices. And the reason for that is because in this very simple model where all the other markets are, are national, all of the general equilibrium effects, you know, the fact that when house prices go up, then consumption goes up, then employment goes up, and spending goes up, and wages go up, and so on, interest rates change, all of those things would be uh, captured by the time fixed effects. And so intuitively they would cancel out across locations. So that's in a super simple model with um, all of these, um, these markets being national and probably not a very realistic model. With a more realistic model where you have local labor markets, um, however, it's also possible kind of to draw an analogy. So there, um, the, the local GE effects that one has in mind are that House prices go up in a particular location, and then people spend more, they consume more, you know, there's more employment in that city, um, and, um, and, and that feeds back again into consumption. And so you have these local multiplier effects. But that kind of chain of logic that you, um, 
house prices go up, people spend more, and the greater spending leads to more employment, which leads to more spending, which leads to a multiplier. That's, of course, the same kind of like logic that we're used to talking about in general with aggregate demand multiplier effects. And so our idea here is that it's possible, given the fact that it's the same kind of logic, to, to draw on the fiscal stimulus literature as a way of, of linking and trying to, trying to quantify these, these local general equilibrium effects. And what we show is, um, is that this local, um, local, local housing wealth elasticity that I estimate uh, can, be, can be shown to be equal to the partial equilibrium housing wealth elasticity multiplied by a fiscal multiplier. Um, so this is the equation that, that we drive in this scenario. Um, beta is, is what we're estimating in the data, and we can show that, um, that the beta is equal to a, a pure partial equilibrium effect sort of scaled up by the magnitude of, of, um, of the local fiscal multiplier, of, of local fiscal multiplier, where the local fiscal multiplier is capturing these kind of multiplier effects that people spend more and that leads to more income and so on. So in an earlier paper, we, we estimated these effects to be around 1.5, um, this multiplier effect. And so you can, I mean, I'm mostly, I'm just, I'm not gonna talk directly about this quantification, but you can think about what we estimated as sort of a somewhat scaled up version of a partial equilibrium um, housing wealth effect. Okay, so now that we have this link between uh, what we estimated in the data uh, and a partial equilibrium housing wealth effect, now I'm going to turn to developing a, a model of this partial equilibrium housing wealth effect, sort of along the lines of the uh, very rapidly developing literature on, on modeling these effects in the data. So this model, um, which we, we refer to as a new canonical model of housing wealth effects, mostly be, not not referring to novelty in our paper, but referring to the fact that there's been this burgeoning literature on this topic, and we're just going to try to incorporate the various uh, features that people have thought about here, and then think about whether this canonical model can explain what we see in the data. So the model is going to have a life cycle feature. So um, people are born at 25, they retire at 60, and they die at 8. Um, and there are going to be preferences over housing and non-durable consumption, um, and also a motive for bequests. Then importantly, there are going to be idiosyncratic income shocks, um, both permanent and transitory. And these income shocks will be uninsurable. Relative to sort of a, an Iagari model, uh, a standard sort of incomplete markets uh, model that you might be familiar with, the new feature in this class of models is that housing, there's a very careful model of, of, of housing. So households can either rent or own uh, a house. Um, we're going to assume a constant price rent ratio, although this is something where we think about some, some robustness in the paper. And, um, and people can borrow to buy houses. So there's um, a mortgage with an LTV constraint, um, and people can borrow up to 80% of the value of their houses. Uh, they can also refinance, um, and, and these mortgages are importantly long-term. Uh, so, so it's it's not like at any given point in time there are sort of margin costs. It's like it's like a realistic kind of formulation of the mortgages. So can have, I ask on, yes. Amy, yes. on the LTV ratio, do you impose it at origination or period by period? Um, at origination, um, but okay. then if you're gonna but then if you're gonna uh, refinance, um, then you know you face a similar yeah. constraint. Yeah. But it's important that it's not imposed period by period because. I'm going to show you the long-term nature of the mortgage contract. We'll, we'll play a role. Um, there's, a, this, there's a liquid asset that people can, uh, can save in that pays a return less than the mortgage rate, you know, so people don't have an incentive to take out mortgages and invest in the liquid asset. And finally, there's default, although this plays a, a very uh, small role in our model, very few people default. For the most part, we're going to, um, you know, we're going to choose a lot of sort of standard values in this um, in this recent literature. Um, and then the other parameters in the model we're going to estimate to fit uh, features of the survey of consumer finance distribution for, uh, for LTV liquid assets and the home value to income ratio. So the, this is all what I've showed you so far is relatively standard to this kind of recent literature uh, on, uh, on modeling partial equilibrium models of housing wealth elasticities. The thing that's kind of different in what we're doing is we have this model 
And then what we're going to do is we're actually going to feed in the actual evolution of state variables that actually occurred in the economy, having to do with the loan to value ratio. Um, and uh, so, so liquid assets, the mortgage debt, uh, home value, income, age, and the price of housing. So these are things that we're just going to take from the survey of consumer finances in a period by period sense. And then we're going to feed into the model and see what the model implies about the housing wealth elasticity. So in other words, um, a more standard approach would be to kind of solve for all of these things endogenously, but then of course you worry the model might not actually be fitting some of those things. Here we're going to be directly feeding them in from the super survey of consumer finances. So in particular, you know, we're gonna be forcing the model to deal with the fact that there is this big change in the LTV distribution during the financial crisis. So here's what we get um, in terms of here, we're gonna do exactly the same experiment with the model as in the data where we're gonna look at a percent, given percentage change in house prices in one location versus another location, and then look at the, um, the response in terms of percentage change in consumption in one location versus another location. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so one comment, Emmy, you know. Emmy, may I ask? Yeah. Emmy, may I ask a question? Will you say something about the precision of that elasticity? So referring back to your previous slide where you showed, you know, the, that increase in this elasticity for some time. I mean, since you're feeding the actual state, uh, you know, how should we interpret this? So your model can't really explain that increase uh, in the elasticity that they saw prior no. to 2000. No, no. I mean, what I'm mostly going to emphasize um, is that even though there was this big increase in LTV, you know, in the data, there was a big increase in the, in the LTV um, during the financial crisis. I'll show you there's a shift to the right in the LTV distribution. You don't see, I mean, I think when, when we started, we sort of expected to see there would be a spike in this housing wealth elasticity around that time period, but the model doesn't generate that. Um, so in that sense, it's kind of consistent with what we find in the data, which means you also don't find that in the data. But you're right, yeah. that we're also not explaining this, um, this earlier yeah. um, evolution of, you know, as I said, that's, that's you know, from the perspective of our paper, kind of a, a positive. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so here's what I meant in terms of the LTV distribution. So um, here's the LTV distribution in 2007. And then you can see that in 2010, there's a large um, rightward shift in this uh, distribution. Um, so this is where you might have thought that people are kind of getting pushed up against their, um, their constraints, their borrowing constraints. And, um, and that might lead them to respond more to changes in house price fluctuations. Uh, but the thing to remember here is I think most of those intuitions come from simpler models where you are kind of forcing the constraint to hold in every time period. Um, so in a simpler model, you might literally, you know, have to pay back. You might literally have to consume less because you're up against your borrowing constraint and, um, and, and, uh, and you just, you can't borrow anymore. And so you have to consume less, but it's important to remember here that, that as we were discussing here, um, here, these are long-term mortgage contracts. And so you, if you live in the house and the house price falls, you know, someone is not going to come to your house and, and collect money from you and, and force you to consume less. So that's an important difference. So, um, so just to show you that, uh, that uh, this model really doesn't, the LTV variation really doesn't generate large fluctuations in housing wealth uh, elasticity. Here's, so here's the baseline model, the black line. Um, which allows for variation in the different, multiple different state variables over time and shows how the housing wealth elasticity responds over time or changes over time as a function of these different state variables. The red line is showing what happens if we only feed in the changes in the LTV distribution. And you can see that the red line is even flatter than the black line. Um, so the shifts in the LTV distribution really are not generating fluctuations in the housing wealth elasticity in this model. So why is that? Uh, first of all, um, it turns out that a lot of the housing wealth elasticity in this model comes from people who are pretty far from the borrowing constraint. So intuitively in these incomplete markets models, um, people are impatient. Uh, so, um, so because of the precautionary motive, beta you know, discount rate is less than the inverse of the interest rate. So if you give people money, they want to spend that. And here is a decomposition of um, the elasticity. And you can see that the total elasticity in this model, so in, um, in, uh, in 
in 2007 is substantial contribution here is from the people whose LTV is less than 0.6, so who are very far from the um, from the uh, borrowing constraint. And even for these people, they have a very substantial responsiveness to changes in house price fluctuation. So it's really, I think coming into this project, I thought that the housing law philosophy was all about these borrowing constraint people, but it's, it really isn't in these models. It's, it's substantially about the people who are very far from borrowing constraints. So it's kind of natural in some sense in that context that changes in the LTV distribution um, wouldn't have a huge impact uh, on the housing wealth elasticity. The, um, the second reason why, the, um, why the, the housing wealth elasticity doesn't respond so much to these fluctuations in the, um, in the LTV is that, that there's a hump in the marginal propensity to consume out of housing wealth. So, um, on the one hand, as you get closer to your borrowing constraint, your marginal propensity to consume as, out of housing wealth goes up. So it is true in this model, even with the long-term debt, that when you get pushed towards your housing, your borrowing constraint, you get more responsive to house prices. But on the other hand, if you go past your borrowing constraint um, and you're actually underwater, then you become completely unresponsive. So that's what this picture is showing here. So the bottom axis here is the loan to value ratio. Um, and then the, the blue line, the, the blue area is the density of LTVs in 2007. The red area is the densities in, in, of LTVs in, in 2010. So this is just showing the shift that showed you before where the LTVs are increasing. But then the red and the blue lines are showing the, um, the elasticity, the housing wealth elasticity for people at each point in the LTV distribution, averaging over the other state variables. And here you can see, just, just look at the, the, the pattern of both of them, I mean, they're pretty similar, that you see this, this dramatic hump that as you get close to, you know, your, your borrowing constraint here, then your, your elasticity gets very high. But when you go past the borrowing constraint and you're underwater, then your elasticity falls to zero. And so another force that's kind of meaning that there's less of an effect of fluctuations in the LTV distribution on the elasticity is the fact that these two effects cancel out. When the distribution shifts to the right, on the one hand, more people get closer to the top of this hump, but on the other hand, more people get pushed out of this hump, and those things to some extent cancel out. Um, and so that's, that's what this is showing, that, that there's, when we go from 2007, 2009, um, you know, there's this pretty substantial increase in um, underwater, underwater households that's, that's playing a role here. Now, um, this fact that the people who are underwater are totally unresponsive uh, to fluctuations in house prices, this is a phenomenon relating to the long-term debt. Um, so as I was mentioning earlier, you could have a simpler model in which there was no long-term debt and you were just in some sense margin called in every time period. In that kind of model, you could never end up um, underwater, so you wouldn't get this canceling out effect that people who are underwater become totally unresponsive. So in a model with only short-term debt, then you actually do get a much larger increase in the housing wealth elasticity in 2010. So here's, here's comparing our baseline model, the black line, to a model that has only short-term debt. In the model with short-term debt, we get the effect that I think we thought we would get initially, that, um, that when the LTV distribution shifts to the right, people get pushed into their borrowing constraints and they're forced to respond more. To Okay, um, and then so, the last I mean, thing I'll say. Sorry, I mean on this. So in the in the sort of baseline model, there's only long-term debt, uh, and in this other model now, there's only, only short-term debt. Yeah, oh. exactly, exactly. And so this is a as a situation where, I mean, you don't you don't have monetary policy in the model, I understand, but uh, uh, with uh, adjustable rate mortgages only, that would also be closer to a only short-term debt type of model, or. Yeah, I guess um, but. Adjustable rate mortgages are also um, also different, though, because the the loan to value, the borrowing constraint, is still only imposed at the beginning. It's true mm -hmm. that you might have to you have to refinance mm -hmm. sooner, and so at, you know after five or seven years, then this borrowing constraint is going to be imposed again. Mm -hmm. But it's not; it's still not every year. Okay. So there was an earlier comment on how. Um, houses are becoming more important. And, and this is something that, that shows up in the model. Um, so 
One phenomenon that does lead in the model uh, to house price, to, to the housing wealth loss to keep going up over time, it just, it's just canceled out by other things that needed to go down, is, is house prices becoming, houses becoming more valuable, which is playing a bigger role in, in household balance sheets. So the, the red line here is um, what you get out of the model if, if you only include a home value variation, and there you, you see that the housing wealth elasticity, if it was only about that one dimension, would be increasing over time. That's just a simple intuition. Houses are becoming more valuable, so households respond more to that. Um, so, so the last thing I, I will say is that, um, interestingly, in this model, uh, changes in credit constraints also don't matter that much in terms of the housing wealth elasticity. Basically, for the same reason that the LTV doesn't matter, because changes in credit constraints affect your distance from this, um, you know, affect your distance from the credit. Um, your credit limit, and that that just turns out to be not not a super important uh, factor in determining the housing wealth elasticity. Again, I want to emphasize here that my whole talk has been about the housing wealth elast elasticity and not the level of consumption. I mean, relaxing credit constraints clearly has an effect on the level of consumption, but we are specifically looking at the responsiveness of consumption to house prices, and for that elasticity. Both the LTV distribution and um, and the uh, relaxation of credit constraints don't don't play a huge role in this kind of model. Okay, um, so let me conclude. Um, so we have these two parts of our paper. The first part is to introduce new estimates of the housing wealth elasticity going back to the 1980s um, using this new sensitivity instrument, which is more precise than the Bartik instrument. And we find that housing wealth elasticity was not particularly large in the 2000s, if, if anything was larger before then. Um, and then second, we, we introduced this model um, and showed that in this canonical model of housing wealth effect, actually the model also doesn't uh, generate particularly large elasticities in, uh, in the 2000s relative to the earlier time period. So in that sense, the model lines up with the data. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.